One of the greatest concerns that did face myself, and also faces a lot of other people, when setting up a bioactive enclosure for the very first time, is to do with humidity. Now, lots of the species that we keep are, well, we're often told that any sort of humidity will induce respiratory infection or similar. So, for example, the corn snake, bearded dragon and leopard gecko that are all in my main reptile room. People all say that if you get the humidity above, say, 25%, then they're automatically going to start coughing, or you'll start seeing mucus coming out of the nose and mouth, um, and that basically it's game over. Reading the traditional care sheets that do say this, it doesn't really take a genius to work out that if you're going to set up an enclosure with relatively damp soil, live plants and absorbent mosses, that surely, if this is correct, then your animals are basically going to go in and get sick straight away, doesn't it? So, in today's episode of Bioactive Basics, I am going to be addressing this question and why it isn't quite right. Now, if you do want to see more videos like this, then do subscribe because I am uploading a video all about bioactive enclosures at least once a month at the minute, so do stick around for those. But anyway, let's get straight into the video. Now, to really address this matter properly, we need to sort of see where on earth it was that the notion that any sort of humidity will cause infection for different species actually comes from. So traditionally, reptiles and amphibians have been kept in basically subpar enclosures. These being tubs in rack setups, where the tub itself is waterproof, decorated really minimally and completely unnaturally, heated improperly and also very poorly ventilated. And then for those animals that haven't been housed in tubs, the next step up has often been a fish tank, where the only sort of vent is, well, the vent is the top of the enclosure, so that sort of generates really poor air circulation. Because instead of cooler air being sucked in at one end, and then, like, say if this is the cool end of your enclosure, and this is the hot end over here, then you try and have a current going in up, from the cool end out of a vent in the hot end and that is much better than in a fish tank say where the vent's just on top and it's sort of no current can be formed. Now then the immediate implication of this is that the air will become stagnant and of course the water particles suspended in that air will become stagnant too as will the water particles that are just sat in the enclosure because if the air is already saturated with water particles then they're not going to evaporate and so they'll just sit there. Pointing that out, it should become obvious why in these conditions bacteria and other pathogenic microorganisms really can proliferate. They're sat in a relatively warm box and they aren't being like evaporated off anywhere, so naturally they're going to do really, really well and of course your animal will become sick as a consequence. Now, believe it or not, going back to the fact that these setups are often um, furnished completely unnaturally does actually have an implication for infection. Now, sort of the entire purpose of a bioactive vivarium is to sort of establish an ecosystem, and this ecosystem, as the thinking goes, is what sort of makes it less of a pathogenic breeding ground. So you do set up a little ecosystem between the detritivores, which includes the, crew, the clean-up crew of woodlice, springtails, worms and whatever else you might have in there, um, naturally occur, occurring microfauna and microflora, then the actual decorations that you've got in the system, if they're made of natural materials, then the pre-mentioned um, detritivores will be breaking them down and stuff, and then finally, of course, the pet herb that you have chosen. This means that, with all things being equal, an animal in a bioactive system is basically going to be protected in some form from pathogens by the different microorganisms that are growing in its setup because they will prevent the pathogens from developing and therefore it's less likely to become infected. There is actually also some evidence to, su to suggest that the activities of all these different critters in the enclosure does actually have a positive impact on the numbers of pathogenic organisms within the bioactive system, but I don't know too much about this so I won't go on about it at length. Unfortunately, I'm quite certain that a lot of people are actually going to take what I've just said as an excuse for letting your setups get really dirty. Surely, if the animal producing waste 
is what generates these positive forces, i.e. the microflora and microfauna from a bioactive system, then surely what I am saying is that a dirty enclosure is better than a clean one. Of course, this is not at all what I'm trying to say, and in a sterile setup, then letting it get dirty is definitely going to just be a really bad idea. If you do have a sterile setup, then it really cannot support the different organisms that a bioactive system can, and so all you're going to have is lots of waste building up, and then pathogenic bacteria are going to absolutely prosper there. So in your bioactive system, you do have that first layer, the cleanup crew, that will break down large bits of waste matter. Then the microorganisms take that further, and then it gets locked in the substrate and potentially used by plants. Whereas in a sterile system, if you've just got the faecal matter there, say, then there is no cleanup crew, and so it's going to attract different bacteria and things, and that is basically going to cause infection. At this point, it's also worth mentioning that a bioactive system is definitely going to be much, much worse for your animal if you're putting it in there when it's sick in the first place. Because if it has got such a bioload of negative bacteria and things, then these are just going to get in the system, outcompete whatever positive forces are there, and, gonna, and it's going to create a cycle of reinfection. Now, I have already talked about this in detail in the last episode of Bioactive Basics, so I'll chuck up a link to it, chuck them up there or there, I don't know. Whatever the case, it'll come up in one of the top right-hand corners of the screen right about now, and you can go and check that out if you're interested after this video. The question remains, of course, what do I actually do with my own setups when it comes to spraying? Now, I'm not going to go and bore you with telling you what I do with my crested gecko and lime day geckos, because they're a high humidity species and the regime in the bioactive enclosures is pretty much the same as it would be in a more sterile one, obviously being much safer for infection and stuff, as I've addressed. But I will go into detail on what I actually do with my bearded dragon corn snake and leopard gecko, because these aren't species that are usually kept with higher humidities. The first thing to mention is that these setups are properly ventilated. My leopard gecko one especially, it's like it's a viv exotic vivarium and they do have loads of vents in them. They are really good for that and they are actually my favourite vivs. Um, Red and Char's vivaria are from a different place and they only have two vents in them each, which I think isn't enough. Um, and I would put more in myself if I had the tools, but they were like custom built. Um, and I wouldn't buy from there again, but anyway, that's what we've got, and as you can see from Red's setup, there is like a decent current potentially going to be formed because of the way the vents are positioned, but either way, the point is that a ventilation current can be formed in all of these setups. Now then, for Char the Bearded Dragon, because he is sort of the lowest humidity species that I have, um, I do create a little localised area of higher humidity that again I've talked about in another episode of Bioactive Basics um, and this was the episode about arid cleanup crews because that is basically what this um, wet zone, if you like, is for. Char actually only gets his humidity when I spray him, which I do sort of every couple of days, just lightly over his entire enclosure, just before lights off to create like a peak in humidity to replicate rolling mists and condensation that would occur when the temperature's cooling of an evening. Um, so again, that's a bit of wild recreation. Um, and apart from the, like, the um, humidity and water he obtains from that, he does get most of his water from his food, um, but he will not drink from a water bowl. But as you can see, he doesn't seem to be suffering without that. Red the corn snake gets sprayed a lot more than Char does, usually about three or four times a week. I don't spray him every single day usually, but I do spray him sort of every other day-ish, and I do vary where in the enclosure I spray and how heavy I spray it. So sometimes I'll do a really heavy dowsing all over the enclosure, and other days I'll do a light spray just at the cool end to mix it up a bit. Now Red does tend to really love humidity spikes. Whenever I spray his enclosure, It'll come straight up to the sprayer and have a look at it to investigate what it is. And even spraying him directly, he seems to quite enjoy it, which is quite interesting to see. 
Um, and then he does actually drink the droplets that get sprayed about his enclosure. Like, if it's on the back wall or something, he'll suck them up. Which, given that he's got a water bowl all the time, is quite strange, but it's what he likes to do, so I'm not going to stop him. Last but not least, Speckles the Leopard Gecko's spraying regime is about the same as Red's, only I probably spray him slightly less, um, and when I do, he's not, that, not as enthused about it. Um, although, again, like in Char's setup, there is like um, an area of damp sphagnum moss for the cleanup crew to retreat to. So anyway guys, that pretty much wraps up this episode of Bioactive Basics, so I do really hope that you've enjoyed it and that you've gained something from it. Now I will just say to round off this video that um, I am doing a QA and a in next week's episode, um, so if you do have some questions for me, then chuck them down in the comments now, because I will be stopping um, accepting comments sort of mid-week. Um, after I've uploaded this video, of course. So if you want me to answer your questions, then get them down quick. Anyway, that's it for today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys. Oh,